I have it in the shoulders now, and then the, I had bone growth over it. So I have limited flexibility now. So they're talking about shoulder replacement on both. See? Um, first, I'm going to get injections, cortical injections. And yeah, I had a few of that in my lower back. Yeah. So you probably had to say, get a You want to put it as for you get, I have reaction like product. Bone groove. What happens is if you, so put, if you have a you constantly put pressure somewhere, especially all around the bone and joints, and they damage, you get inflammation, and that continuous inflammation well, causes bone growth or all bones growth or a few different things. Osteo, osteophytes are called a few things, and it grew over uh, that femoral head on both sides because there is you know, that arthritic component, which basically they say I have nothing in there anymore from all the you know all the abuse. So now it, it hurts when I try to lift too high because it, it inhibits it from the bone perspective. That's why I hear the click, 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 and stuff like that. So I, I haven't touched anything. Got belly. I haven't touched anything for about four or five months. I've been going back and forth to specialists and, and uh, listening to them. I, I, I don't really want to get shoulder replacement surgery on, right. bo on both. Yeah, because at my true. age, I'd have to have that done again. And if they're only meant to last 15 to 20 years, I was going to do it right. <laughs> Assuming I'm going to live more than 20 years. <laughs> Maybe that's a big assumption, but <laughs> I'll take that. I'd rather have that assumption. <laughs> So we'll see. <laughs> I hope, I hope you don't. But it's good to hear that you, you know, the PR is great. That's always fun, right? And even uh, Christian, uh, no, Christian and Peter, they went up on on like this. Okay. Like okay. I got so yeah. Thank you. We've been we're trying, we're trying to be consistent over the winters. So. It takes it's hard, it especially, but it, it, it does settle you down in your mind for for you know for education, for work, for whatever. Exactly. It's a good balance. It balances you out a lot. I did that a lot when I was an, when I was an undergrad and a grad. Actually. So I, it's funny. I used to I used to train with one guy. I was in grad school. He was an undergrad. We'd go to the wooden center, and very seldom like would there would be a lot of people. We'd work real hard. He's now an MD, um, and he specializes at the University of Washington doing something. And I can imagine walking in there. He's a big guy, big arms. <laughs> like wait, wait. <laughs> we had we, we had a, we had a bio factor that used to brag about how he hit three plates, and we used to think, well, that was not a lot even for us back then. But we also I don't think he did. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have fun with it, though. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Um, I think I'll take roll at the end because I'm sure we'll have a couple of people kind of filter in, um, and then I'll take roll. So I have two people. Uh, is, let me ask Sandra Navarro. So you still have to ask for the permission number, right? Okay, you, okay, just make sure. So I'll take roll at the end here. Um, any questions before we get started? The clock's in the right place today. So everybody can see where we're at. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So we left off. We're, we're in that section talking about kinetics, right? And we kind of jump right into this because there's not a whole lot to talk about from the things that we learned in 101 at this point. So we looked at rates and we saw if we looked at a balanced chemical equation, if we took the rate as either the loss of a reactant or gain of a product, these things all equaled each other. And I think that's where we left off um, right before break, our last lecture. So in doing that, let's take a look at this equation here. And this says in the first 10 seconds of a reaction, the concentration of the iodide ion dropped from 1.0 molar to 0.868 molar. So let's do two things. Let's calculate the average rate of this reaction in this time interval, and let's determine the rate change in concentration um, of the H plus ion during this time interval. So a couple things I want you to think about when you're looking at this. Um, we're looking at the first 10 seconds, so that's the initial part of the reaction, which is really important. Because the initial part of the reaction versus a little bit later in the reaction, are the rates going to be the same? No, right? We saw, we saw that already. We saw a chart that indicated the rates are going to go down because I'm going to be using up some of that, and now I won't have that available anymore. Okay, so we're looking at the initial part of the reaction. Um, what else am I looking at here that could be relevant? What else is important? It dropped. The change in concentration. I've changed the? Concentration. The concentration, and I'm go am I going up or down? Down. Down, so am I using a reactant or a product? Reactant. reactant. That's really important here. So we're looking at the reactant. Uh, I'm looking at the loss here of the iodine. Also, average rate. Why average? The time frame. 
right? It's over 10 seconds, so it's from zero to 10. What if I ask specifically at five seconds what's going on? That's the instantaneous rate, absolutely. How would I find the instantaneous rate? Take the concentration, and how would the con? So I'm looking at the instantaneous rate. So I'm going to take a concentration, and I'm going to divide it by that by a time. How am I going to determine what the time is on that? If I tell you it's say five seconds, what would I need to know to, to figure that out? I need to have the curve because I'd need to see the loss or gain, whatever I'm looking at, and then I would take it at that point and do what? Find the tangent of it. And then from the tangent, I would be able to figure out, right, what the instantaneous rate is, which is different than the average rate, which is really the thing we've been speaking about. Just want to point that out. That's just something that's uh, useful. So we are talking about the average rate here. Okay, and then we're going to look at the term. So now I have data here for iodine, ion, and then ultimately in my second part of the question, I'm going to try to figure out data for the hydrogen ion, right, or for the proton. Remember, H plus is just a proton, so if I call it that, you know what I'm talking about. Right. How do I do this? It's going to be the one third of the iodine? One third concentration delta I divided by delta T. What's delta T? 10. And it's, there's a negative there, so I have negative one third, so I also have 1.0 molar and 0.868. Which one's initial, which one's final? The a point six eight. Final, so I take this minus this, right. and then I should end up with A. How would I find B? Times two? Uh, times a half. Is the answer that you got yes. from A, and use it as the answer, and then find the uh, right change of concentration by putting an X on the other side as well, correct? Yep. Right. So I have to set this equal to that. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. Correct. In terms of rates? Isn't that what we did? Something like this? Mm -hmm. And then I already know what that equals, and then therefore I can do whatever manipulation I need from the twos or the fours or whatever I have, and I can figure out that rate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now we've developed the strategy. Let's take a look. So the rate is this, negative one-third delta concentration of I, iodine, iodine ion over delta T. Just plug in the numbers. We get 4.40 times 10 to the minus 3 molar per second. Why are there three sig figs there? Because of the molar? Uh, Just to quickly go over sig figs. Why would I not use one because of the one or the three here? Conversion? Because they are what kind of numbers? They're exact. Exact numbers. Right? I don't knew I don't I never use exact numbers for sig figs. What numbers do I use for sig figs? Measured numbers. Right. When I say exact, of course, I'm referring to how many dozen. If I say I have a dozen donuts, how many do I have? Twelve. Twelve. Do I have twelve point one? No. no. I'm exactly. That's an exact number. So you don't use that for a sig fig. Right. One over third. This is exact. Now I do. The, the what, what I want to make sure you just remember. So I don't use these. So I have these things to use for this, and I use three here, right? Because only what's in the coefficient are sig significant. Just to kind of remind you. Um, can I just say three, 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 this must be three? Or three, four, three, the smallest one is three, that's three? Right, I have to do the order of operations. I have to subtract this, and then from this, you'll see you do get three sig figs. And then three divided by three maintains the three. I just want to point that again. Mixed operations, if you recall, from 65 so or 101. So you would use the one minus the eight the base first? Yep. And then divide by once you have that number, then you divide it by 10 and then 3. So divide it by 10 and then again divide by? Yes. Or you could, of course, go 3, three, three times 10 down here. Yeah. Okay. Either one is okay. Either one. It's the same thing. <laughs> okay. So I end up with this. This is my rate for this. Is that what I'm looking for? And now I need to figure out part B. Part B, the rate change in concentration of the H plus ion or the proton during the same time interval. So I can set this equal to this, and then equal to whatever I just got. So I had one negative one third, right? And now I have a minus uh, a minus one half of the concentration of the proton over the concentration of or the, the difference in time here. 
and that should equal this, because that should be equal to what we just did. And then I could simply find delta H concentration divided by delta T. Does that make sense? So that's what I want to make sure you're aware of here. What does this say? In the balanced chemical equation, are all of these equal to each other? Yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm setting equal there, right? I solve for one, I'm now setting it equal to the next one. Does that make sense? That answer that more clear that way? Yeah, I'm going to go back and forth a few times because uh, on a lot of these because this th that type of question comes up regularly based on what we're doing here and sometimes it's better just to go back. Okay, so that equals this and now I simply solve for delta H, H proton or just the change in proton concentration over the change in time. So I divide and multiply by 2 and get rid of the negative end up with negative 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 3 molar per second. And that's moles per liter, again, certainly. Is that okay? So that's just exactly what we talked about and discussed prior to doing the problem. And then these are just the numbers as a result of doing the problem. That's the reactant, and it's leaving, absolutely. Wouldn't it be 0.088, not 8.8 times 10 to the negative 2? Are you saying there's a calculator? Anybody have a calculator? Yeah, I have a calculator. Yeah, 0.08. What is it? Uh, 0.0, 10 to the negative 2, 0.08. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's divided by 10. So there's a thing that's happening. 2 plus 10. No, 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 no. This whole thing equals this, right? Yes. You're just multiplying by 2. Oh, yeah. But what about the... You're asking for the rate of concentration. So does that include... Does that include wait, wait, wait. The rate and concentration are two different things. The, con the rate is the concentration divided by a time frame. That's a concentration divided by the time. Okay. That's the rate. Right? Yeah. Brad? So here we're trying to determine the rate change in concentration of each plus. Right. And then if it was a product that we were talking about, it would be positive. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Let's try another one. So the following data is collected, and a lot of these things, as we move forward, you're going to see that some of the things I'm going to talk about coming up, you have to have data for it. Right? These things are figured out experimentally a lot of times. They're not figured out just sitting on a, on a piece of paper or on a board. A lot of these things you have to do the, you have to do the experiment, figure out the data, you plot the data or whatever you need to do, and then from that data you figure out different uh, things that you need or that could be helpful to you figure it, to doing other things in the future. I'll, I'll talk about that when we get into rate laws coming up next. Um, so here, I have some data here. So here's the time, here's the concentration. And the very first thing I'm going to point out is what's the concentration of? Which is the reactant. It's pretty much, so if I ask that kind of question, you probably want to think of it as a reactant or product. Here's the chemical equation here, and it looks like this thing just breaks down into two of them. So this is of the reactant. Right. So it goes down over time, as expected. So if I, did, if I didn't give you this, let's say, and I just gave you this, and I asked if that was a reactant or product, which one would you say? Instantly reactant because it's going down over the time, mm -hmm. right? Just different ways to think about the same kind of thing so you don't get confused. You put it all together. Okay, so let's see what, what kind of questions they have here. A, what is the average rate of reaction between 0 and 10 seconds? So now they're looking between this range here. Right. <clears throat> um, anything else? Okay. So that should be pretty straightforward. Right. Nobody has a problem with this? 0.93. Okay. Negative this. Minus one. This 8.7 times 10 to the third molar per second would be the average rate to six of this reaction. Yeah. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No big deal. Nothing new from what we did on Tuesday. So now, 
what is the rate of formation that should instantly tell you you're looking at a product? You're forming something. Okay. And of the C2H4 between 20 and 30 seconds, so now I'm looking at this time frame here. So that would be equal and then times. What do I do now? So find the rate of this one. Right. Absolutely. I can't jump directly to that rate, right? I don't have the data for that. Right. I don't have the data indicating the rate of formation <laughs> here per second. I only have the rate lost per time of this. But I can form the rates within the balanced chemical equation relative to each other. So if I find this, I could set it equal to whatever it is to this in terms of the rate, and then I could go ahead and solve for the C2H4. Does that make sense? Everybody understand the strategy there? No. So once again, I'm going to take you back to that slide. You'll see why. Here. I could set these equal to each other based on the balanced chemical equation. So if I could find one, I don't have data on this. I have data on this. I could figure this out and then correlate it based on what this ratio is, whatever it may be. I don't know that. It's going to be different in this one than the one we have. But that's how I'm solving for it, since I don't have data for this directly. So I'm doing it indirectly, in other words. Does that make sense? Okay, I want you to constantly think about this when you're doing these, because if you can't, you can't just jump right to this one if I don't have that data. Right? I have to take the data I have and then manipulate it to solve whatever it is I'm asked to solve for. So if I'm in a lab, that would just be whatever it is I need to solve for because of what I'm trying to prove or show or demonstrate or figure out. So I take this, and I solve for it between 20 and 30 seconds. And I get this. Now I take this, and I correlate it to the other. So I get this. Oh, that's awkward. OK, let me make sure that you guys are following along. So. So the two. This is actually here, right? If you're, you're looking at this thing they took here, and they just automatically did. This should be one half here, set to this. And then right. you just multiply by two, and that's why it's over here. Yeah. Does that make sense? OK. <laughs> they just kind of jumped the step on you there. Make sure that that's clear. Actually, I, I think this whole. I think the whole thing is a little odd. I would have just said, okay, I have this here. I would set it up, whatever the other one is, which is going to be one half mm -hmm. um, concentration of what that C4H2? C4, C4 C4 C2H4? Right. Over the delta T. And then that equals whatever that number is, and then I would just adjust it after that. They kind of, they, they try to throw these two things in here. I would just, I would have taken this thing out, left this as one half and equal to this, since that's what it's equal to. So you're just trying to get a C2H4 by 2? Yep. Because of this. Yeah. They want half, yeah. Uh, so I just moved it to up here. <coughs> From here, I just moved it there. Right, right, right. That's why it's awkward, because it doesn't. They jump a step there on you, so if you're following it, it's harder to follow. Um, what's the difference between rate of formation yeah. versus it's rate of change? Why is it specific to Because of product. Forming. It's just another way to say it. Rate of formation, you're developing it's a product, you're forming it. Rate of disappearance, no. which is definitely oh, the reactant. Okay, and then that would give you this. And that's what you want. So while I'm, I'm going to wait, because I hear a conversation back and forth, which is good, I want you peer to peer conversation. So if you guys are discussing it, or if anybody's unclear, Go ahead and let me know. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's good. Oh. Just do this and set this equal to the number. I wouldn't set it equal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's why I pointed it out. Go ahead, Dina. Basically, when you want to find the rate of that, 
Oh, so you want to have a whole number. So how do you make this one? If this would be one third? <laughs> Without doing all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you multiply this by two. It's already negative, but yeah. the result should be a position. Because the, the one on the right is on the reactive side. And so when you set them too close to each other, the thing on the reactive side has to be negative. And on top of it, actually be negative. Maybe so I should do this. The part on the product side is See the one below this saw that it's negative reaction from that slide that I've gone back to multiple times now. <coughs> C4H8. This is negative reaction. These are equal to each other. So what did I do here? I solved for this. So there I just simply plugged into here. That's it. Is that okay now? <laughs> <laughs> this got cold in there. This thing here, for my here, this here equals. I'm adding too much. Let's just leave that. This equals this. This equals equals this, let me actually change this for a second to make this easier. So then this plugs in <coughs> to there. Right. That's it. That's all that is. Is that easier? Is that better? Anybody not clear on this? This is an awkward representation, but this should clarify. This equals this. You just we, we learned that, right? That's the beginning of the lecture. We solve for this, and you're just plugging this into here and then solving for this one. That's it. That's all you're doing there. It's okay? Yeah. Does that make sense now? Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. So, calculate the rate of disappearance of the iodide pair ion in example two by two different methods and compare. Okay. So, how would we do this? So, this is looking at example two. I, this is kind of a bad question here because you don't have the data put up for two. Right. So let's see if... Um, well, we can use the original, right? You, that's what you're using, but it's just not up. So I'm just going to show it to you. You don't oh, have okay. it sitting there where it tells you what it is. Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm just going to say, okay, this is what it was. <clears> and let you know if you, this way you recall. And you can solve for this. Okay. And then you could also do the same. You could do the same thing by starting with something else. So um, I'm still solving for this, but I know that this is going to equal... They do this weird thing again. Mm. Let me make sure this is clear. What I'm going to do here is oh, no. this. I want to make I want to make this clear what this is. It should be. Um, so what I have is I have one third concentration of I minus delta over delta T is going to be equal to what am I looking at H plus? So it's going to be one half. This is negative. It's going to be one half delta H plus over delta t, okay? If I do that, and I'm solving for here, then I simply move the three over here. This is equal, right? This yeah. is basic math. Get rid of this. Three halves. Three, get rid of the negative, negative, and now I have what this looks like. Even though there's no negative there? There should be. There should negative. be. Yeah. Uh, no, they're on the same side. Yeah. There's no both. But shouldn't, shouldn't there be negative over the negative? Oh, yeah. So the negative is I left out the negative here. Okay. Move it over, it becomes positive. 
They're both negative because they're both reactants. Would it be um, cleaner to help? I just wondering would it be cleaner to calculate the change of H, like the the rate of disappearance for one side, and then already have the molar number multiply to it, and then plug it in? Does that make sense? Like you would multiply it by three. All you're doing here figure. is just figuring out. So they're asking for two methods. So you only have one set of data. You don't have anything else. You don't have data for H plus. You don't have data for I minus. You have data for I minus. You don't have it for the peroxide. So you have data for this, nothing else. So your first one, just do that. But they're asking for a second. You can't do it any other way other than set up the correlation <coughs> rate between this or this, and then use that <coughs> to solve as you have this here. That's all you can do. There's no other way to do it. There's no other setup, that's all. That's If you had the data for the H plus, then you could solve the H plus in the context of I minus as well. Right? That's the solution. So then, no, yeah. I do the same thing. So this is for this, but only for this and No. This is, yeah. Where does so then you want to get it again? equal to, to one. So you so multiply it or something like two. Oh, so you're talking about the H plus? This, this equals this. Uh -huh. So you just plug it in back in here. So this answer? equals to one half of this. Every time you do one of these problems, I want you to go back to this slide. And what does this slide show? The relationship between the reactants and products and their rates. All I did was I set up the rates based off of the balanced chemical equation. That's it. Same thing. Okay? That's all I did was set it, set it up equal to the same. It goes back to this slide every single time when you're doing these. Does that make sense? The only th reason why I <coughs> don't like when they put it up like this is because you don't see that trans that so you don't see that comparison right away, uh, and therefore you don't see where they where they're getting these from necessarily, right? But they, all they did was take it a quick step ahead and not show you the exact. They just set it to whatever they wanted to set it at and did it as though you would know it because it's a math that you know. And so the three seconds is just a way of converting between the two and it doesn't actually affect the rate of change, right? Yeah. There's no uh, one third versus alpha i. But they do have that Because it's asking for the rate of disappearance of i minus. Just disappearance of, of the, that's the rate of the disappearance. Not just of Literally, that's, this is what they're asking for here. The other one is when you're setting them up to make them equal to each other so that you can solve for them. So originally is the one third on the second method, mm -hmm. but then, right, simplify. So the yeah, the second one is the one third. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's the only way the rate will be the same in that chemical equation, based off of the balanced chemical equation. Right? Because they're not coming from two different reactions, it's all from the same reaction. Right. So that's why it matters. Is that okay? Have we gone through the rates? Like set up equal in stoichiometric ratios? Is this the stoichiometric ratio? Okay, let's try another one. A plus 2B gives you C, some generic form here of a reaction. And it's saying the initial rate is 0 0.100 molar per second at a given, <coughs> given conditions. What is the delta concentration of B over delta T under the same conditions? Okay, so what do I do here? <coughs> so the initial rate, 0 0.100 molar per second, what does that equal? Let's just go with that. That's the initial rate. rate. So let's look at what, compared to A, what would that be? Negative change in concentration of A yeah. over the change in time would equal 0 0.10 molar per second, right? Yeah. It would also equal negative one, one half, half B, B right. mm -hmm. over the time over change of B over, over change of change time. in time, right? 
right? And also equal to one change of rate on C or one change of rate on time. So I have negative one half change in concentration of B over concentration of T. Right. Everybody okay with that? That should equal the initial rate. 0 0.100 molar per second, right? right? And it wants me to figure out what this is. Same conditions. That's what I'm solving for, right? Right. So then this becomes negative so C. times 2. C. And that's pretty easy. That's negative 0 0.200 molar per second. Right. Ideally, all test questions will be that easy, right? <laughs> <coughs> that okay? <laughs> Ideally. I thought B was like the initial moments per time. Say that again? So, and, and this might apply to others too, so I want people to think about what she just asked. You're already given. So let, let, me, let, me, let me do this. Do you remember in, um, I think it was 101, where you learned how to solve for heat, right? So you were given the specific heat capacity. You had a mass. And then you found the change in temperature, and that from that you could figure out how much heat was either gained or lost by something. Right. Q equals m times c times delta t. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you were told that the initial time is say 10 seconds, and the final or 10 degrees Celsius, and the final time was 100 degrees Celsius or 10 or 100 degrees Celsius, right? And sometimes you're just told that it took. 90, you had a difference in 90 degrees Celsius. So did you have to care about the initial final when you told it was 90 degrees? It, it jumped up or it dropped 90 degrees. Did you have to figure out the initial and the final jump? No. Do you hear? Right. Right. That makes sense. It's given. Right. <laughs> You're not solving for that. They told, they told you it. If I said you had this initial concentration and this final one, then you would have to solve for that, but they gave you this. You don't have to worry what was initial, it could have been anything. Anything that gave you that number, right? It's already given. That makes sense? Everybody clear on what I, how I just described? <coughs> yeah. Okay. So then, oh, oh, we actually had choice. This is even easier, right? We had choices. <laughs> so what's the right choice? Do we, have, do we match? Yeah. We matched, good. So they don't show you how to do it, so that's good that I did it over here. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. By the way, that's a great teaching lesson there. If you did have this, of course, you're going to get a, a combination on all the exams of multiple choice and solving problems. Right. When it's a, when it's a quantitative thing and you're solving it like this, you don't want to look at that. Mm -hmm. Solve first and then go match. Don't look at it and try to match it directly to the answers. That's where you'll come into all kind. All of a sudden, all these answers are designed to look right towards something, <laughs> some mistake, and one of them's going to be right. So if you start trying to mix and match, you could mix and match it to anything, and it will sound good, and then you'll move on. Don't worry about what these things say. Do what you know, solve, and then see if it's there. If, you stood, if that doesn't work, then maybe take a look and maybe you could figure something out that way. But try that first. Hey, how are we doing? Everything okay there? Okay. So, <clears throat> the top part just says everything we've been talking about. So if you're not sure of the top part, then um, you know, reread that later on at night. The idea here is then how do you determine these things practically, right? 
So what we've done is we've done a couple little things, discussed what things meant in terms of rate. And now, if you were in a laboratory, how would you determine this? Is really what this next, um, I guess, set talks about or the discussion. Basically, you usually use something called a spectrophotometer. And I think in the setup you probably have in your book, you have a light source, shoots light source. What is light? Energy. Right. Shoots energy into something. Eventually, you get to a prism, which then deflects that light on specific, what are they called? Wavelength. Wavelength, thank you. You get particular wavelengths that are now going to go through samples, usually in what's called a cuvette. So I'm going to sit there and I'm going to do, I'm going to look at something like this, a chemical reaction. And I'm going to say at 10 seconds, I'm going to take a little bit out. 20 seconds, I'm going to take a little out into a different cuvette. 20 seconds, I'm going to take another one out. So I'm going to have multiple different cuvettes with, at that point, I've stopped the reaction to see what I have in there. I'm going to put those cuvettes in to see where this wavelength of light energy is hitting it. And that will then go onto a screen and tell me information. That information can then, through a series of different things, can be translated into, let's say, how much protein I have. So I may use 495. That's a pretty common wavelength to use because it hits particular protein amino acids. So right, just to remind us, chemistry, not bio. But you have proteins that are made up of amino acids. Some amino acids, about 20 of them, that aren't you know, uh, altered ones, basic ones, that have rings on them. Those rings give some kind of absorption to the 495 wavelength of light. Okay, So when it hits that, then the more absorption I get, the more I know I could, tra I could take that number and through a couple manipulations, I could translate that into a concentration or an amount. In this case, an amount of protein. So I could then say, over 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, looking at A, I should have more, less, less. Hence, the type of data that you just saw here. So that's how I look at, and I say, okay, over these time frames, I have a cuvette at the beginning, then at 10 seconds, I pull some out, pull some out, you know, just a small sample, 10, 10 microliters, 10 microliters, all the way down. I run it through my detection, and then I start to see how much I have left. That's just the way you determine um, these types of things. And then you put that into kinetics, which are these rate studies, is all these are. Okay? Um, so that's what we're looking at here. How I just described it are all of these things here. So if I have. So color is another way if you're just visualizing it. You know, if um, where in 101 did, in, in some of the experiments did you see a color? There was one thing associated with a color. Blue? Uh, the copper. Copper. Yeah. One of the copper ions, right? You had copper plus and copper two plus. The copper two plus showed a blue color. Right. So if I, was, if I wanted to just visualize, let's say, something like this, I have copper two plus maybe in a reaction, and then I say, okay, I pull some out, pull some out, pull some out, and I say, well, it got less and less blue over time. That's because I have less and less of the copper two ion, would be an example of color, right? Can we say about the base, basicity of the redox when it becomes basic, and would that account for that or no? You know, when, it, when you add the phenolphthalein, then it starts turning into pink? That's one way, yeah, okay, so that's an indicator. Right. Um, but see, the problem with that is that doesn't show the products or reactants lost or gained over time. That just shows when you're at the equivalence Privilege, points. Right. But it is a color, it's a visual, but that's more of an indicator, not a, you couldn't do kinetic studies because you wouldn't know all the way until you got to that point where that happens. Are you seeing the change in concentration? Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't, you, you don't know, right? You're usually trying to figure out a concentration to something you don't know. Gotcha, right. Right, right. You don't know. How would the detector It computes the absorbance, and then you plot it, and then you figure out the absorbance. You figure out there's a you could figure out how much absorbance of something at 495 
gives you how much in terms of mass in a gram, and then you could go ahead and figure, you could do the gram in that correlation through a massive blue protein gel. Um, titration. You showed the reduction. Okay. It's gonna show the reduction. That you yeah, well, as you take known samples of protein and you put it in and you see their absorbance and you plot it. Right. You plot the amount versus the absorbance and then you, you develop a standard curve. Then you take your sample and you put it across that curve and it will tell you how much you have. You'll know the volume, you figure out the concentration. Okay, so, so something like this. So here's my light source slit. Uh, this allows the separation into the continuous spectrum. This isolates it into the sample. Sample hits the detector. The detector then prints it out for you here. And by the way, you may not have to do what I just said. That's how we used to do it before we had better equipment, better <laughs> technology. You could probably, it probably now there's technology where it just pops up. I used to literally have to stain gels and calculate it and everything else. That's why I know it so well. <laughs> um, that was a long time ago. But so anyway, so this is, this is one way to detect to see if you have either a gain of something in products or a loss of something in terms of reactants. So you could look at it either way, depending on what you have. So ideally, you're, you're identifying something that's being gained or lost that's easy to identify. So that's how you would choose which one, right? If I know that a particular protein is being made, then I might want to look at how much I increase that for that particular protein. Okay. Or if I have something that's a little easier to determine as being lost, then I'd look at the loss of it. So properties appropriate and easy to monitor. Now, this really, I think, is this in your book? Anybody yeah. have the book? It's in, in, in the notes, but I don't. I doubt this is in your book. Anyway, anyways, okay. Well, this is coming off of an old way to think about things, but when you're, so we're going to get to this. This is a little premature at this point, but in this class, we're going to start discussing some things, and when we get to it, you're going to be able to say, okay. If I have something on my reactant side, and now I have something on my product side, if there are gases, and they're not the same amount of gas in terms of moles from the reactant side to the product side, then I could monitor things that are associated with gases, like pressure and volume, if the other things are constant. Because I'm gonna have more on one side than the other. So I could monitor that. But that's only if the gases aren't the same on both sides. So if I have something that's, you know, um, say NaOH, and let's say it's a gas, HCl is a gas, goes to H2O as a gas, and NaOH is a gas, I have one, two moles of gas on that side, two moles of gas on this side, I can't do anything with that. I can't tell the difference between the reactants or the products that way. But if I had three moles of gas here and two moles of gas here, in my container, if I kept the volume constant, what would the pressure be on both sides? Would it be higher or lower on the left side to the right side? I have three moles in here, two moles in here. It'd be higher on the left. Right. So I could monitor the loss of pressure, for example. That's what this is trying to tell you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, if I kept the pressure constant and I allowed like a piston to move up or down, then it would get the volume would get greater as I increase the number of moles from one side to the other. But once again, if they're the same on both sides, I can't use that as a technique. Okay. So this is just basic ways to monitor things. We're gonna do something like this. Um, what is this? Oh, there you go. So this just tells you what I already said. Um, you'll be able to do that on paper. So you're gonna do that a little bit later on when we get more sophisticated in our knowledge base. Right now, we're just dealing with very, very basic stuff. Could be the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure, no? What's that? The equilibrium constant in terms of pressure? We're gonna look at a lot of things. <laughs> This, I'm gonna take this out. Flammability is not easy to measure quantitatively, and therefore, why you would ever even wanna know that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this, I, um, this, needs, this is probably from an, also from an old book. The other things, at least you'll apply at some point later in this class, this clearly you won't, but properties that are not appropriate or inappropriate to monitor would be something like flammability. And that's obviously because you can't measure any intermediates. There are none there, <laughs> right? But there's no reason to, I, I'll, I wouldn't worry too much about this. Mass, conservation of mass in a chemical reaction, so I have the same amount of mass on one side, same as the other. Obviously, I can't really monitor that, okay? 
if I was just looking at mass as a whole. But can I monitor density? Yes, absolutely. Why? What's density? Mass over volume. There is the volume component, right? So then with the density, if I had more moles on one side of gas than the other, let's say more on the reactant side than the product side, and I looked at density, how would I monitor that? Would it go up or down as the reaction went forward this way? It's going to go increase on the end. It's going to increase on the end. So you, if you have volume on the bottom, right. right, and the volume is now becoming less in the reactant, then this is going to increase. Right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to transition. Um, let me see. Let me make sure we're in a good spot. But when we just talked, all we did up to this point was we looked at rates. And then we looked at the stoichiometric ratio of rates within a balanced chemical equation. I want to be very clear on where we're at and what we've done. Now we're going to move forward. The last set was just a way to monitor and how to figure this stuff out. No big deal. Obviously, you have a sense of it. But here now, we're going to look at what's called rate laws. So the difficulty in this class, and especially when you start in these ch early chapters without having a lot of knowledge in this, is to separate where we're transitioning and adding information and how that information is being collected and added on to. Okay? We looked at rates, we saw what rates are, we saw what they are relatively within stoichiometric ratios. Now we're looking at the dependence of the reaction rate on the concentration. That's what's gonna tell us rate laws. Within the rate law, as we determine it, we're gonna keep expanding and learning more about it. So we're gonna take it, we're gonna look at it, and then we're gonna unpack components of it and how to solve for them. But the first thing you need to understand is why why this is considered something different than what we just did. It's not really different, but it's a different type of thought process that's applied to the same thing. Because in a rate, as you know, you already have the concentration as part of the rate. So now we're gonna look at how the concentration affects the rate. That's what we're gonna talk about now, okay, to make that clear. Then at some point we're gonna have integrated rate laws where we look at how the time affects the rate. And so that's how we're now gonna break up the different segments and then dissect how to figure them out and what they mean. Okay. So the dependence of the reaction rate on concentration, so here's. By the way, here, um, if I was monitoring volume and I was looking at the product, what would I expect to see an increase or decrease in volume? Right. These are all gases. That's the first thing. If they're not gases, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's another point I'm bringing up in terms of the physical state of things because that becomes extremely relevant throughout the cor this course. So I'm starting. I, the reason why I'm doing this is I want you to start identifying. What, in 101, for the most part, we say, okay, this is this, and we tell you about it. Obviously, aqueous was important for double replacements, but we really don't touch too much on what the physical states are. In fact, a lot of times, at least in my lab, I think I let you guys go and not put physical states and chemical reactions at times, you need to know it now, okay? Because this is gonna matter. These are all gases, that matters. There are two and one, three moles on this side, two moles on this side. So that means that the volume is going to decrease if I'm looking here, right? Right. Less moles, smaller volume. Pressure, see how I can now assess both pressure and volume, just to give you a sense of that. So, one other thing here. I think I've mentioned this at the start of this lecture, but these things have to be determined experimentally. Okay, well, some of the stuff we're gonna look at, so it's not like you could figure it out without having data, unless it's just given to you for the class purposes. All right, so it, when you're actually in a lab, in the real world, you actually have to get data to figure some of this stuff out. So let's keep that. So, this is experimentally observed rate of reaction. I think the other thing is a good place to stop, just to, just to make sure that you're clear of what I'm doing and why and the progression of this. I'm gonna tell you something, 
and I'm not going to tell you certain things. And then I'm going to break down what I didn't tell you constantly throughout from here on out. Okay? So I'm just going to give you some overview. And you probably have questions, but then I'm going to break that down. And then I'm going to break it down more, and I'm going to break it down more. And we're going to constantly learn about some of the things. So I might say, just know this for now. And then we'll get to the places on what you need to know and how to figure out what these things are coming up. Okay. There's a rate. If I look at this reaction here, and I want to know the rate, based on a rate law, this is equal to K, which is a constant, times the concentration of one reactant, times the concentration of the other reactant. We'll learn about K later on. That's probably at the end of this chapter. There are a lot of things that are involved in K. For now, it's just a constant. So any type of reaction, if you want to know the rate of the reaction, you could write it like <clears throat> this. K, the concentration of each of the reactants. Okay. Now I'm going to add to that. Um, if I look at each one of these individually and I say if I take this and I increase it mm -hmm. actually let me go back why are we looking at rate laws the dependence of the reaction rate on the concentration right. and make sure that we're I'm clear on this so I'm now looking here's the rate law for this chemical reaction and if I look at this if I do something to this what happens to the rate that's what this is saying. That's what rate laws are about, okay? Really important to make sure you understand what, where we are, where we're going forward. As you saw in the last section, where I kept going back to that one slide. So in this case now, hopefully we don't go back and forth to the, to the original slide so you know where we're starting. If I double this, what happens? To the rate. How do you know? You see it. Experimentally determined, you don't know. A lot of different things can happen. Don't presume that it has to double. What's your presumption when you say that? Let me ask something really basic that you'd know from, from um, Chem 101, if you're in this class at this point. If I double this, and I have excess of this, mm, <laughs> right. I'm not going to do anything. I already have excess of it. So if I double it, who cares? Yeah. Because what's the rate limiting reactant? This one, right? That's called the limiting reactant in that case. What's the other assumption you're making there when you say that? It's a huge assumption. That it happens just like you see it there. In 101, didn't we break up in Hess's Law and you saw that there were different stages, that right. and different really mechanisms and stages? It's not just... This is just the final molecular equation. There could be steps that happened in here to go from here to here, including catalysis. So you're also assuming that it's just a one-step process, not multiple steps where there's a mechanism through it. Because in that case, what's the, what's the rate-limiting step, not just the rate-limiting reactor? So there are a variety of different things going on here. I want to point that out really, really early. So you do not know what this or this will do if you increase or decrease them relative to the rate of the reaction. You don't know. You have to do it experimentally. Okay, so let's say we double, the, we, uh, we double this concentration and it doubles the rate. That's information. That goes somewhere. And okay, we'll discuss that in a second. So I'm going to add on to this. And I double F2 in this particular example, then the rate also doubles. This is, that's really odd. That's what they want to leave you with. There are exponents here. Right. What happens when you do something like double this, leaving this constant to see what happens to the rate, will dictate what goes here. here. Okay. Go ahead. I'm going to get more into it. I'm just kind of giving you a preview because I don't know why they're showing you th these things shouldn't be there without any explanation because it's not necessarily what will happen. They're just saying, in this case, it happened, but they're not giving you the case. <laughs> they're telling you a lot of stuff without telling you anything. <laughs> so I, 
so I have to fill in the blanks, but we'll get more detailed on that. This way, at least you know that there's a meaning to it. It's not just there. Reaction order. Now, looking at here, the capital letters are the reactants and the products. The lowercase letters are the coefficients. Mm -hmm. What's above the arrow? Catalyst. It's catalyst. Something that's doing something to, to the probably speed up the reaction, right? Mm -hmm. Either heat or whatever. By the way, do you always want something to speed up? No. This is something that, for whatever reason, is not discussed much because usually you do want it to speed up, let's say. But what if you want to slow it down? Let, let me ask you this. When you, when you think of things like cancer, right, those are things that happen in cells. What's actually happening there? They're not regulated. Things are something, some part of something is not regulated, right. which means that you keep making more. Is that a good thing? No. No, it's not always a good thing to make more. Just keep that in mind. Most of the lectures are always going to be geared towards here's how something works, and so of the and in general, yes, it's better, but it's not always better. That's not how things work. So keep that in mind. Always keep that as a as a backup. It's not always going to be exactly something improving because in that case, something uh, constitutively active in a cell that constantly duplicates, right, as opposed to differentiate is not a good thing because you, it becomes cancerous. That's a bad thing. So you don't always want more of something. So in that case, if I had this, I'll probably want to look and try to pull out the catalyst because I don't want to speed this reaction. In fact, I want to find something to put in there that blocks it. I may even want to put in something that blocks the catalyst, which is another way to why it may not always double just because I increase something, right? If I put in something, if I put too much in, it could act as an inhibitor. That's called feedback inhibition. So there are all kinds of different things that you have to think about. I'm only presenting one part of it, but I'm trying to put it in context as a whole because it's not all the same. Okay, so there's your catalyst that you guys told me. And my rate now will include not only these two things here, my reactants, but it will also include the catalyst. Okay. And as you see, the thing I mentioned in the last slide, the addition to the rate law here are these exponents, M, N, and P. Those are random. They don't need to be called that. You could call it J, Q, Z, whatever you like. Does each one represent something different? Are they all exponents? They, they're all exponents. The exponents represent something, yes. And they do not represent what? The coefficients. That should be obvious because I didn't put little a there and little b there and little c there. Um, if you had more than one catalyst, would you just add that on? Mm -hmm. Like catalyst one, catalyst two? Yeah, you could do that, absolutely. What would that imply, though? Actually, so, okay, so my, my instinct is what would it imply, but you could actually have it for multiple reasons, but what, what would that imply? Yeah, who said that? Yeah, absolutely. That would imply that the cat, where do you see that all the time? How many of you have not had biology since I, I'm a biochemist, which is why I constantly talk about bio things. <laughs> you, that was those, the two people have not had any bio. Three people, four. So if you need, if you need any extra information, just ask me. If I say something that doesn't make sense. In, in bio though, at this point, if you had any bio, have you looked at something called the Krebs cycle or the TCA yeah. cycle? Yeah. Or, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's that little circle thing. And how many enzymes are in there? Yeah. <laughs> are, are enzymes catalysts? So if I want to say the breakdown of my three carbon ring at that point, once it hits that cycle, right? After going through uh, that intermediate glycolysis, maybe they have a name for it now, they didn't back when I went to school. <laughs> right, after glycolysis, that intermediate, then it goes to a bunch of CO2s and you end up with a lot of ATPs. Right. So if you want to call that a whole reaction going from the three carbon ring down to the CO2s, how many like enzymes do you have eight. there? And how many catalysts? Right. Like five, six, seven? So that, that in that case, at different multiple steps, absolutely. But maybe maybe I could have something that speeds something up even faster. Maybe they can collaborate in some way, right? That's a possibility. It's a little harder for that because it takes a more a sophisticated system, right? But um, that could be as well. Okay, so here's the rate right here of this particular um, chemical equation. Okay. So these are generally integers, but they don't necessarily have to be. What they are not, for sure, is the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. They must be determined experimentally. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. 
anything else in here? That's the rate constant. For now, that's all you know it as. By the way, constants, get used to them. If you're shy and you don't like the term constant, learn it. Go look up a dictionary. Remember, we're gonna go constants, constants, constants all semester long. This is gonna be the foundation for most everything we do in all of our chapters, and we're gonna, we're gonna dissect what this constant is. There's a reason why these are constants. Up to this point, in a lot of cases, in, early, in, in beginning classes, you just learn it as a constant, and then it just stays as a constant. Well, we're gonna actually figure out what this constant is later on, right? We're gonna determine how it drives this thing. So if I have a rate, let, let me go back to Tuesday. And I'm going really slow here because I wanna make sure our foundation is good, right? As we go f further and we get into some uh, different um, examples, I might go a little faster, but at this point, I really want to make sure that everybody's on board early on, because if you get lost here, you're lost for a while, right, until we move on to equilibrium, <laughs> which is the rest of the chapter. So we talked on Tuesday and said, well, what kinds of things affect the rate? Right. Concentration, yeah. concentration, temperature, catalyst, temperature. Right. Where is temperature in any of this? Constant? The, the, so do you see how you could, I don't need to tell you, I guided you there. If I didn't, if I just asked and didn't ask those questions, you might not realize it. But of course, that's going to be wrapped up somewhere in here. Right. The so we're going to break that down and we're going to unpack that at some point in this, uh, in this chapter. But for now, it's just a constant. But I wanted you to have a sense that there's a lot of information going on in that constant and how to figure it out. Right. right? But for now, we're just going to call it a constant. We're going to leave it alone while we try to figure out some of these other things. Um, is this one of the products? Nope, not in, not in the rate because we're in this, in the rate laws, the rate laws are specifically looking at Reaction. the loss of something. Okay. okay. Units of this constant will depend on some other stuff that you have here. We'll, we'll, you'll see that. What will it depend on? Okay. Those. And how many reactants and how many uh, catalysts you have within the system. Temperature, oh, there you go. That actually tells you at this point, temperature dependent. Right. Okay. Reaction order. What other kinds of things? By the way, in a, in a chemical reaction, biological system, and I know we learned this in 101, I think. Um, what do you do? I think we might have learned it during Hess's Law. When you take one thing, mix it with another, and form something, does it just form, or is there something, is there something else going on? How does that, how, what, what things go into that process? Well, they have to pass each other. Right, the ionization. You have to separate, you have to what? The ionization goes you have to into like going back and forth. Do you need energy, usually? Yes. Yeah. Ah, what did you just call it? The ionization energy. Ionization energy was one thing, right? Yeah. What else? If you had an exothermic or endothermic reaction, I'll bring up some new other terms that you should know. If it's exothermic, did you gain energy from the reaction or did you put energy into the reaction? You gained it, right? It went to the surroundings. Endothermic, you put energy into it, okay? Either way, did I have to put some energy in to get the reaction to go? And then what happened? It went up to a certain place and then if I did what? If what? It either kept going up or it So it has to go down. Yeah. And I started with an energy here. If it went down and the difference was. Oh, yeah. It goes like a minute. If it was higher here, that meant endothermic. I put it in. If I got more back out, so it was lower, yeah. that was exothermic. What did I overcome initially? The activation, activation energy. Yeah. Might that be in here? This is a reaction. I have to have energy going in. Shouldn't there be some activation energy that needs to get it going? Yeah. And what we mentioned, temperature. I did this, I don't know who everybody had, but for you guys that had me, you will know this. <laughs> These things are moving around in free space. They have to be close to each other. Would that increase the opportunity for them to interact? Yeah. What about orientation? Yeah. Absolutely. Are all of these things potentially wrapped up in here? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. To determine whether or not this will or will not move forward and what I need to do to get it to move forward. In other words, 
All of these things are going to be extremely important, but this is really important. I'm not ignoring it because it's not important. I'm ignoring it now because it's more complicated and we're going to get to it later. Okay, and we're going to break it down. But now you already have a sense at least of what goes into it. Okay. Now, we're going to now at this point transition and focus only on determining these things and what they mean. Do they have a name? Yes. The reaction order? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The name of the exponents that we're going to focus on now are called the reaction order. That's what you're going to determine through this. So the exponent, if you could read this, no big deal. Not right now. About 12.30, about half an hour. So these have to be determined experimentally. No other way to do it unless, of course, I give it to you on an exam because you're, clearly I'm not going to give you an experiment to do to figure it out and then solve the exam. But just for you, but if I had to give it to you on an exam, how would I present it? If it was, if I said you had to do this experimentally or had to be determined, what would I do? Data. I'd give you the data. Absolutely, right? It's kind of neat because, okay, you didn't actually have to do the data, which would take time and you could make <laughs> errors and whatever, right? But now you're getting the data and you get to interpret it, which is usually the funnest part of an experiment anyways, right? Even if it's not what you thought it was going to be, that's usually where it becomes more fun because you get to now see the results of what you did, good or bad. Okay, here's, what would be my, um, how would I write my rate law for this? My rate now, this is very important. I'm not asking for the rates in a stoichiometric ratio. I'm asking you for the rate law of this. And now you see why I took my time making sure I'm separating as we move forward because these things do get confusing, I promise you. So K2 and K2. different than asking for the rates within the stoichiometric equation. Okay. Uh, I turned straight to, it's too bad. It's eh? uh, so good. Okay, forget this, we'll deal with that in a second. That's the rate law. This is what I wanted you to see. That matches this. This is the rate for that particular um, equation. Now, in determining these things, let me, I don't know what it's going to tell you, but I don't like the progression it's going, so it's, it's kind of annoying me, <laughs> because I think it's going to add a lot of confusion, because it kind of jumps, and it doesn't tell you something, then it jumps back for no reason. I need data, so let's assume I have list of data, okay? And I have data that will tell me concentrations of these things next to the rate. Concentration and rate. Okay. And if I look at, in this case, I only have two. I could have three. I could only have one. Okay. If I have two, I look at the data and I say, where do I, and this is traditional, that you could potentially have something different, but let's, let's start with this. I always want to look at doubling. If I double the concentration here, mm -hmm. what happens to the rate? It decreases. But I, if I have more than one thing here, then what? I have to make sure that that's not changing. Otherwise, I can't assume that this change is, is specific to this. So the one that I'm not looking at has to stay the same in terms of its concentration. And then I look at the other one that I care about, and I say, if I double that concentration, what happens to the rate? Based on that, I could determine these things. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll try to keep you guys to follow along with however random stuff they do here. That's the essence of what we're doing. Then the only thing you need to know is if it's doubled, the rate does double, what does that mean? What order is it? And we'll get to that. Two, three orders. Like the reaction order representative of how a reactant affects the reaction? Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So doubling 
this, doubling the concentration, <laughs> doubling and assuming this is constant, doubles the rate, that means that it is first order. Okay, and I'll describe that in a second. Yeah, see, this is just real odd. So um, it's first order with respect to the energy. Yes. So, yep, take rate, rate two over rate one, here's the rate, here's rate two, I doubled this here, right, that's doubling this, what happens to the rate? You, this cancels, this cancels, this cancels, you're left with two. That's all they're showing there. Just a real awkward way, in my opinion, to represent it. So if I double the concentration, then I double the rate, is what they're saying in this case. But just of nitrogen. But what does that mean? That translates into this is a first order. Huh? But this is, this is, That's for you. This, this, I'm not gonna give you any, you're not gonna need to interpret anything like this again, unless they have another one on these screens. So I'm gonna show you how you're gonna interpret it. If you, would you be able to use that equation though, in order to find the, um, in order to find the experimental, to find which order it is? Well, it, only because it tells you here. If it didn't tell you, what would you put? But like, so if, this, you, if you had a different, um, Reaction. But you still have to know, you have to know what it is, so you still need the data. This doesn't have any data here, right? You see what I'm saying? If I just gave you any reaction and I didn't tell you anything, I just said double the concentration, what happens to the reaction rate? How could you figure out anything from here, right? If I told you double the, double the concentration of one of the reactants or if it's a catalyst, which usually is not the case, um, and then I told you it quadruples the rate, well, then you could figure out something gotcha. because then this would become four. So if you were to say that you're doubling the NO2 and it is a and it's a first order with respect to NO2, then could you say it yes, doubles the rate? Absolutely. Okay. Directly. But I haven't time. got to actually laying out all the rate orders yet, so I don't. You're yes. you're 100 right. <laughs> you're absolutely. That's and that's where I am leading. So if I did tell you that the that this was a first order, then you already know that that you got a two here. Okay. Right. You already know that you double. They, they're one and the same. But let me, let me get to that. There's a, I'll give you a chart to, to verify that. So M in this case is first order with respect to NO2. Once again, why is this awkward? That's why I laid it out the way I did initially, because if you double a concentration of a reactant within the rate law, and that therefore doubles the rate of the reaction, it's called a first order. What's that one? You can only determine that through experimental data, though. You can't do that on your own, right? Okay. So that's just equals one. And when I say that, then what does that mean? First order just means that it's NO2, and you don't put it there, but it would be a one. In this case, you put in an right? M? As opposed to a two or something else. Okay, and that's called first order with respect to NO2. Now, let's say that N is also one. Now, once again, I'm not doing all this other kind of stuff. So then it's a, then, First order with respect to F2 as well, if N was 1. And that kind of goes to your question, Taylor, right? Which is, if I knew this, now I know this. Yeah. Okay. So with respect to each one of the concentrations based on reactants or catalysts within the rate law, you have to determine the rate order of them, which is just the exponent associated with the concentration. And now for the overall reaction, you just add those together. Really doesn't tell you all that much, but if it's asked on a multiple choice, you'll know. So what's the, uh, what's the um, reaction order of the whole reaction? Two. Two, one plus one. And that makes sense, it's doubling both whole doubles. It will. <laughs> so the overall order here, one plus one, two. Okay. Once again, this. You're not really gonna to need to know too much about that. That's not gonna give you a lot of information to anything, but it's good to know so that you can distinguish the difference between the order with respect to one of the things within the rate law and the order of the overall reaction.
<clears throat> okay. Oops. Okay. So the rate law for this, now that I've spent plenty of time, I'll go ahead and move through here. I'm, I'm putting this down and I'm giving you information here. Okay, what did I give you? That this must be one and this must be two. Right. Okay, you didn't have to figure it out. I put it in. If I put it in, it will be, that's, that's what it is. So M equals two, second order with respect to NO, and N is one for H2, so first order with respect to H2, and overall is going to be three. Also, I'm going to point out again, these have nothing to do with the coefficients. Okay, sometimes they may match, sometimes they may not. That's not how you figure them out. Okay. It's a common mistake, which is why it's put up multiple times in this. <laughs> okay. But then you add them together again? For the overall reaction, the reaction is third order. Okay. Two plus one is three. These were given. Yeah, we haven't, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really, really important. Okay, I'm just developing it. I don't really like the, the way it does this, but, okay, let's see. What would be, okay, here's a reaction. Now this would be the catalyst, so I have to include that. So I have this, okay. So what's going on here? What else is going on? There's no I2. I2. Okay, so let's see. Let's let's dissect that. So we've looked at first and second order. Mm -hmm. What if what would this mean? Zero order? Zero order. Zero order. <coughs> equals one. Right. If that was one, would I put it here? No. No. So you have information on that. Because you know it's supposed to be in there. That just means it's zero order. So now we've seen zero order, first order, and Second order. What does it mean overall? So let me now, I, I don't like the progression here, but let me, reaction order, okay? Zero, one, two is what we've seen, right? And what this means is that if I double the concentration of one of the reactants with the other being constant or the others being constant or catalyst, then at zero order, what happens to the rate? No, no, nothing. nothing. The rate doesn't do anything. So this is double, I multiply by two, by two, by two. The rate stays the same. It stays the same. Independent. If I double, and it's a first order, I double the concentration of one reactant or catalyst, and therefore the rate doubles, mm -hmm. that's what happens. So this doubles. What about if I have a second order? That's exactly right. And that's the relationship between the reaction order, the concentration doubling, and therefore the resulting rate of that doubling. Okay. I think there should be some slide at some point. I just It's odd because we keep going through that without you having this thought process, right? We just keep adding on without really putting it all together. and put it together late. I like to start with it all and then break it down. That's just a new so, so here, that's why I'm setting up the rate here. So if you saw this, you'd know this is first order, first order. What's the overall reaction? Second, Second order. Second order. Okay. okay, so this is just emphasizing what, what I showed you over here on the sideboard. And there we go. So that's all. They're saying the same thing again here, basically, from the other slides. As we put together what a rate law is and how to determine it. Now they do. Reaction orders are frequently whole numbers. That's great. They don't have to be. Reaction orders may be fractional, so I don't know what the point of this is, but um, this kind of tells you something different from that, whatever. Um, reaction orders may be zero, as we saw. Okay. Reaction orders may be negative. That's another. Okay. No. If I have, okay, here's, this is interesting. So if you're not sure what you're looking at, let me, let me, get, let me get it up to, um, so take note of these two. These two are a little bit different here. Maybe fractional, 
may be negative. What, what you're looking at is if the re, what the reaction order is, when you double that concentration, what happens to its rate? Okay. That's, that's essentially what your question is and what the core of what we're looking at. So let's see, okay, here, good. So if my reaction order is zero, that, so first of all, I take, a con I take the concentrations from a, rate, from a reaction, I double, I'm doubling it. If I double it and I get no effect in terms of the rate, I know that it's a zero order. In other words, I could just keep adding more and more and more. And I gave you an example of what that would be earlier, right? I have something that's already in excess. So I keep adding more, it's not gonna change the rate of the reaction, it has no more impact on it. Okay, makes sense. Now, I have, I double the concentration, I double the rate, it's a first order. And we saw that, that's, that's a more common one. In fact, your intuition told you it would always be that, right? <laughs> Initially. I take the concentration and I double it, and I quadruple the rate, it's a second order. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at something like this, let's just say x, Zero equals one. X one equals X, right? This first order, second order. Two equals squared. So quadruple. So two times two squared is four. Quadruples, right? So that should make sense. The four. Now the two you just asked about. What if it's negative or one half? X to the minus one. All right, what is folks, that? To the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same thing as saying one half. Right. Which is the same thing as one over X. All right. Right? Or a square root. Yeah. Yeah. So when I double the concentration, the rate cuts in half. And that's a negative order. So when, when would that happen? <coughs> well, I mean, what kind of things can you? Bitter. Well, what? Bitter. When it slows down. Right? Say again. Oh, Dieter, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't. That. You had I'm your mouth sure. covered, so I, I couldn't quite tell if you were actually the no, one saying it. And then you kept looking into it. Go ahead, Dieter. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Enzyme inhibitor. Okay. Um, yeah. What if, what, if, uh, what if I had something that, once again, are we always thinking linear, like it just jumps from one thing to another? Are there intermediate steps going on? Yeah. Right. Can all kinds of different stuff happen? Absolutely, right? All kinds of different things are going on. So I don't necessarily know where the bottleneck may be, but maybe I'm adding to the bottleneck, right? The rate limiting step. Now also, if I have, if I double the concentration and the rate becomes a square root, that just means I cut it in half, the order. Okay, so that would just be, did I do that? No, this, I did this one, this one is just, this. And then the other one would be x to the one half, right? And that would give me the square root of two. Which is the same thing as x. 0 0.5 if you wanted to do it on your calculator. Okay. Okay. So these are the more common ones. These are the ones we're going to focus on. You have some general idea of this. Um, you could look at like ozone, I think, for some of these where you're forming. Um, for example, the half, a good one for, the, uh, for this one would be if I took something and I doubled it, and it went through multiple steps, and at the end, the products of those steps got together to form something. Then you'd need two for one, and so that cuts it in half, as an example. Um, I think ozone might be an example of that, if you look at the progression of the, if you have to start with oxygen, and then you convert it to ozone, and then there's also a backwards reaction to it, right? Right. So then you're dealing with an equilibrium of things going both directions, and that also can slow things down. If I start from Le Chatelier's principle, as we'll learn in a little bit, and I increase one side, it forces it the other way. But sometimes by putting too much on one side, forcing it this way, then as you make more, it starts to go back the other way. So there are multiple reasons for this to happen. With this, I'll stop, have a good weekend, and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.